Okay, uh, thank you for having me and thanks for hanging on towards the end of the meeting here, folks. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll briefly, briefly just quickly start to, on acknowledgements because a lot of the work that we're talking about today really takes a large team of folks to be able to conduct the type of work that we do from clinical psychologists to biomedical engineers, obviously neuroscientists and students. It's just a, a really large group effort. Um, a lot of the work that we're talking about today has been done by Alice Graham and Mark Rudolph from the lab, um, but also a, a big chunk has been done with some collaborators at Washington University, Nico Dozenbach, um, and some of our um, software engineers. Okay, so I'm, you know, my primary work that people most know me for is, is studying child and adolescent brain development. Um, but I'm going to be kind of fitting in with the theme here, talking more about some of the new inform work that we're, we're doing underneath the guise of these two bullet points. So there are two challenges that we often face when studying functional brain development, especially if you're a child and adolescent development person, is there's methodological challenges related to differences in scanning children and adults. And the second is that there's conceptual challenges and that we often fall into this cognitive box of assuming that trajectories start during the periods of development where it's easiest to collect the data, okay? So with that said, in that context, there are two main goals of my, my, my talk today. One, I'm gonna talk about functional activity MRI and the earlier slide we saw in the first talk, motion, motion, motion. And the other is I'll talk about some of the early influences on these brain trajectories that's kind of a new a new avenue for the work in, in my lab. Okay, so um, just discussion about graph theory is a good segue into this slide. So a lot of the work that we've done in the past has been using uh, functional connectivity, which is just simply the correlation of the bold signal between two regions, and graph theory to identify specific patterns that exist in the data. Now graph theory is simply, you know, you know a, a discipline where you just measure has, it's just, about networks, which are simply collections of nodes that are joined by some line or edge. In our case, our, our nodes are simply our brain regions, and the edges are simply the, the correlation between those brain regions. And, what, and one of the things of many that we've been doing in the past is, is using these algorithms called community detection to identify, the, to identify specific networks in the brain. Now, the algorithms that use community text are, are, are relatively basic. There's lots of them, but they all fall into this, the same guise where they're trying to maximize in your system the number of inter-community edges relative to the inter-community edges. Now, <coughs> I'd say probably over the last, I don't know, 10 years or so, not quite 10 years, but it seems like, it seems like that, is that this, this kind of discipline has really taken off, and we've been able to identify several systems in the brain that are in a relatively small number that are, can be replicated and identified in many ways using, using graph theory and community detection as functional connectivity, uh, this functional connectivity business. So much so that it, some of these systems have become just part of the normal nomenclature and not really recognize that some of, some of them have been identified in the relatively recent, in re recent um, terms. So systems like the frontal parietal network, which are involved in moment-to-moment -moment attention and processing, things like the singular percolar systems that are really highly involved with sustained attention, um, the default network, which is, which is often heard of, heard of or even sometimes misconstrued as being func the functional connectivity signal, is really important for internal mentation and planning, and things like the dorsal attention system, which are also important for attentional vigi vigilance, working memory, and things like that. Of course, there's other systems like primary motor and sensory systems, but these are just a few that I'll come back to in a little bit. Now, <clears throat> these systems have been replicated um, with all, lots of different methods in lots of different labs. So using ICA, you can see these types of systems. Um, there's some other papers that have been showing that you, even from down to the voxel-wise level, you can use those to, to describe your whole graph and identify the same, same identi identical systems. There's also been lots of, um, of new data showing that if you get, as long as you get enough data, that you can be very, very precise, even an individual subject, to identify exactly where those systems exist, in, even in one person. Now, with regard to development, um, what we know is that, is that here are just a few examples. This, this slide is a little bit hard to see, but I'll just tell you the gist is that there's been lots of evidence now that as long as you're correcting for motion, well, well enough that the, the systems exist um, in childhood, in adolescence. Um, 
you can see the motor systems, single protocol default systems. There may be subtle changes that occur over the, the, the pot after that period that are, that are within the, between these systems, but the identification of these systems are largely exist. In infancy, um, we know that, at least in early infancy, we know that the systems are, a lot of the subcomponents of the systems exist, but that there are, appears to be some changes. So for example, you might take the, so the motor sy system can be identified with these methods pretty clearly and even down to one and two year olds, but there's other systems like the default system here where you can see in adults these things are highly, highly integrated, these subcomponents. In one and two year olds, the components of the systems are there, but they're not clicking yet, so to speak, right? And it's the same type of pattern exists in other higher order systems. So the frontal parietal system has a similar type of profile that I just described um, and so forth. Now, as far as development in psychopathologies, we know that the, the way that these systems are organized are, seem to be atypical across a wide ranging set of disorders. So um, just as just one example of why we do a lot of work in ADHD where you can see how the community structure is atypical if you're, um, this is the control population looking at the sustained attention network, the single program network, where it can be atypical in ADHD, relatively not. Um, some of that atypical connectivity can be rescued with, with uh, interventions like me medications. Um, so just to recap, just the background here, so we know that the, this use of graph theory and functional connectivity to study systems organization to provide us with this framework to consider how this organization relates to typical and atypical development. Um, we know that the brain is organized into these large, sc large scale networks or subsystems whose Integration relates to specific cognitive demands, like attention, working memory, planning, et cetera. And that while progress in understanding how these systems develop is emerging, you know, the detailed accounts with this regard have been somewhat slow. And the question is why? Well, we've heard it a couple times today. Part of that, I believe, is because of this confound of movement. So movement is probably, in studying development, child development, particularly with functional connectivity MRI, is one of the biggest obstacles in, in obtaining high quality data uh, and really at any age. So um, now of course it's not that people haven't known that or that haven't been considering that in their analyses over many, many years, but it's that we were, were measuring it wrong or accounting for it wrong in most cases. Okay, so in, in, in the past folks have often used the simple, you know, you do your register, you do your you know, frame to frame registration or frame to template registration, you can get out your translation and rotation numbers and we're using those at the ground, ground truth as for movement. Um, but those are not the measurements that are likely that, that link with the artifacts you see in bold data. Most closely, rather, it's the measurements that you get on a frame to frame basis, okay? So the relative amount of movement from one frame to the next is the ones that, that, like, that correspond most strongly with the actual artifacts in the bold data. So in, this, in these pictures here, what we're looking at is derivations in the bold data over time and how they link up quite nicely with these frame to frame dis displacement measure measurements relative to measures of RMS or just your rel relative translation rotation measurements. This is very nicely demonstrated by Jonathan Power in a, in a very popular paper in 2012, um, but several others have, have done this, done, done this, shown this as well. All right. So the other problem with this in development is that, which is why a lot of the, the data up until now has been contaminated, is that the artifacts aren't simply white noise, but they're, all, they're, very, they're systematic, meaning that if you movement, the same amount of movement will cause, will cause a different profile if the, the distance between those regions is close versus whether if they're further apart, okay? Meaning the, the artifact you see in the data is actually distance dependent, right? So that means that if in your, in your, that means if in your, if you're studying development or your clinical population or anything like that, if you ever encounter for this in the right way and there's differences in movement, then you're going to see artifacts in the data. So this is just an example of that. So if I take, uh, this is over the last seven years, we've probably scanned close to 1,200, 1200 kids across different, eight, different ages and different clinical profiles. Um, this is just a, a scatter plot of the mean frame displacement for, for all of our, all of, this is just 241 of the typical, typically developing controls as a, function of, as a function of age. 
And what you can see from these data is that there, there is, although small, on average, there's a slight decrease in the amount of movement over time, okay? Um, this is what, this is another group, another cohort of kids with a, a, at risk for um, alcoholism. They have a family history, They're mostly in adolescent period, but you can see that the trends are following the same where you have this decrease. Notice, of course, that there is overlap in these guys. This is what it looks like if, I, if you bring in a bunch of kids like we do that have ADHD, and you can see that, again, that there's a monster decrease in these clinical populations, and it's different from the controls. Here's what it looks like if, you're, if there's, in, in, in the case of our autism cohort, and what you can see from all these is that there's, nobody has a similar type of motion profile, and there does appear to be, on average, this decrease in age across all the groups. Okay, so this is a, a big compound. Now, if you study, um, if you study gender differences, then this is, it, the compound remains. It, it certainly shows that if you, female participants or girls are much more cooperative in the scanner environment than boys, and that that also can cause, that also can cause artifacts where you see these gender differences that are driven largely by movement. So this is the, this is the big problem, all right? Now, <clears throat> one of the ways that folks have been describing how we might be able to account or adjust for these types of artifacts in these data is by getting rid of the bad data, by censoring, censoring out frames, okay? Now, this has become very popular. Um, there's been tons of other methods, of course, that are, people are trying to employ, but this one seems to be very robust at getting rid of the artifacts, but there's problems, of course, in that, in that if you're getting rid of um, data, that means for a big chunk of subjects that there may not be enough data left for you to actually analyze if they're moving too much, right? Um, and this practice is, this is quite common. Um, and throwing away corrupted data post hoc can be very expensive, especially when you're studying children. I mean, we don't, I know my lab's not rich, <laughs> and just throwing away data at the, at the end of a scan can be problematic. So <clears throat> one of the things that we've been doing along with, again, my collaborators in, at Washington University is developing some very simple, easy to use, out of the box, um, software that folks can use at the scanner to give you information that's specific to your study about the amount of movement, whether there's enough data, whether you need to acquire more, or, and so on. We call this um, FrameWise Real-Time real Integrated Emotion Monitoring, or FIRM, um, and I'll describe a little bit more about what that is and how it may help some of your data. So here are just a, a few of the folks that have been, been working on this project. Again, myself and Nico Dozenbach at, at WashU have been the primary investigators of this, but then we have several other, other software engineers that have been helping out with, with the project. Now, just a couple notes. The, the software is freely available and downloadable via, via our website. And, and that's in development. It will be out soon in Nitric. This, we're working, the paper is just about published. Um, it primarily, primarily right now works with Siemens scanners, but it's in development with GE and Philips as well. Um, and it's been tested successfully in children, young, young and older adults, and there's, we're currently test, doing additional testing in infants as well. Um, just as a couple of quick notes. Now, the, the, the software itself is self-contained image in, the doc, in a Docker. It uses a, an outside Linux box, so you don't need to put anything on the scanner computer. Um, it contains all the necessary libraries and, and things like that. And simply um, to run it, you just need to, you essentially need to press start and you need to set up this DICOM streaming, which is all, I'm not gonna go over that, all that, all those details, but it's all in, all in the documentation. Um, and it successfully then monitors the amount of motion that you have in your data. Now here's, it's actually, this is an older version, but it, it looks like this, it looks very similar to this now. Here's the way that this works, where we simply monitor the motion in real time as the subjects, much subject in the scanner, gives you the display gives you information, oops, I'm sorry, gives you information about the usable frames on a given subject as, a, as for a given run or across time. Um, tells you what your community you have, it and it also gives you a little crossbar for your text or people who aren't familiar with your study. Again, it's modifiable that you can say, give them some check mark that says that once you acquire this much data, there's, it's, you're, there's, you're, you're good, okay? The other part that we have in here that I think is really important and shown to be useful is that there's a module that actually predicts the amount of data that will be successfully scanned by the end of the run, and that it gives your, your participant, it gives your techs, um, it helps them plan whether they should maybe abort, you know, what they're doing right now and try to collect, use the, use the hour that you have for other, other data collection, 
or whether you might want to stop and retrain your participants and things like that. All right, so there are several examples. I'm not going to go through a lot of these, but so, you know, this is the subject who's been moving. Can I? Okay. This is, you know, just a quick example of a really outstanding participant who's not moving a whole lot. And this is a, an example of a subject who's move, moving a ton and is not acquiring t enough data that you might want to, that you might need. And there's other examples as well, including, including a way to, turns out that this is a good sleep monitor. <laughs> So if your subjects fall asleep, sometimes they'll kind of look like this, and then all of a sudden their movement stops. And, and you know, you might want to, if you see a pattern like this, you might want to ask your participant if there's any chance they may have fallen asleep, because it turns out that happens often. Now, we know that the, the algorithms that we have to do the, do the registrations are very, are very tight to the post processing, so that's, this is what this is kind of showing, so the offline movement numbers are very tightly correlated with what you get with, what you get with the online stuff. And also, should we also have some demonstrations of how much time you can actually save in the scanner by doing, doing something like this. So let's say you have a protocol that you set up when you have, you have say, 10 minutes of data that, you, that you're acquiring, but you're needing, that you, your protocol or your experiment needs at least five minutes of movement-free data to be successful. So here what you can see is that if I have this amount of data in the controls and in the, the adolescence, you can collect about 80% of the data, but if you, so 80% of the time, you'll be good, and you, you won't need to collect any more data on a given subject. But, uh, but on 20%, you'll need more. And that may, if you even just increase by five minutes more, you can, you can get up to from 80% to approximately almost 90% of, of successful scans in your subjects. The same thing for it's even more, it's even a bigger effect, of course, in the clinical populations, because if you have collect 10 minutes of data in, say, case of autism, the, the, you only, only about 50, half of your subjects will actually have enough data in this one specific scenario. But as soon as you can, if you can collect just a little bit more, you can get closer to 65, 75, um, even up to 80% of, of, of successful data collection. So I wanted to put this out there because of, the, because of the, the type of talk I was giving today. And I just want to give a quick recap before going on to the next piece. So probably the biggest obstacle for obtaining high quality data in any age is motion. There's lots of methods that are being developed. You can watch, look at three rows at the posters about prospective motion correction that are still in development. But until they're done, this may be a good, a good way to deal with some of these issues. Um, and if people are interested, there's, a, um, there's an email right here that, that again, that makes, the, makes the, you can just send us a note and we'll, as soon as it's available, we'll, we'll send it to you for download. Now, the other thing that I know I talked about before in the lab that we're we're dealing with as being a child and adolescent developmental neuroscientist is that we're trying to understand these early influence on brain trajectories. Now, so when do these typical and atypical brain trajectories actually begin? Now, like I was saying earlier, most of the work that we do in our lab is, this is just a, a quick timeline. We saw something like this earlier of, of, of life from conception all the way to the end of life at approximately 60 years old, where we, my lab primarily focuses on the development of the brain in from this period to this period. But of course, during these early periods, I don't have to go over this for this crowd right now, there's so much more stuff happening with regard to neurogenesis and apoptosis and cell migration that are, can be largely influenced by early factors, okay? We think that identifying these prenatal influences on early brain development may optimize, optimize opportunities for prevention that, things that we see later time points, one of the questions, well, why have we done more in this realm? And the answer is it's, it's just super hard to collect really large data sets uh, on these types of data. We've seen some good examples of that so far in the prior, prior talks. I'm going to show you what I think is another one that's been aided by a couple of my collaborators who are really good at this. Um, Alice Graham was a postdoc in the lab and Claudia Buss and Patrick Wadwa, two close collaborators who We've been kind of working on this model where we're trying to understand how the maternal placental fetal biological state relates to fetal brain and, and, and newborn brain organ development and organization and how certain types of environmental factors may influence the, the whole process. And the whole idea is then do these, do these changes that we see, the relations that we see actually relate to these potential atypical developmental trajectories. Now, this, for the data I'm going to show you now, it's, it's in this sample of approximately 70 healthy mothers and infants. It's actually up to about close to 90 now. Where we get data points from mom at three different time points, and um, first trimester, second trimester, and third trimester, we collect a bunch of data on, at, at 
the baby at birth, including brain imaging and functional connectivity, and functional connectivity imaging. And also then we've been following these kids for, sev for several years now. Now, <clears throat> the, we get tons of information. I'm, I'm going to focus on just a few here just to get started. Um, of the information we get at during the maternal period, um, I'm going to focus primarily as, as, um, on the inflammatory cytokine IL-6 during pregnancy um, for lots of reasons. But IL-6 is secreted by immune cells in the body um, to stimulate immune response, typically during infection or trauma or something of that nature. And then IL-6, along with other inflammatory cytokines, interacts with the brain. Um, inflammation, we know from epidemiologic studies, poses risk for psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia and ADHD, like we just talked about. And that these types of associations have been shown through various studies, including infection, high, high psychosocial stress, and things like diet or high body mass index. In fact, if you look across pregnancy, in our, just in our sample, you can see there's a very, very tight relationship with the prenatal BMI, I mean, sorry, pre-pregnancy BMI and the average IL-6 levels that the mom will have throughout pregnancy, okay? Now, <clears throat> for our purposes, we're, the analysis that we're talking about here today, we're going to be using mean IL-6, and the reason for this is because this is all of our three trimesters of all of our moms, and the level of IL-6 stays relatively constant. It's not exactly constant, but it's relatively constant across time, so um, we'll be, that's what we'll be using for just for um, today's talk. And the idea here, the first step is say, well, does, is there a relationship between the maternal IL-6 and, and brain connectivity at this and newborn time point? So to do this, what we're doing is first we're, we're going to be using, um, getting regions across the brain, apply, getting the connectivity matrix for all your, our participants, and then taking either a within a given network that we described earlier and taking all those connections or between two networks and generating a model that tries to estimate or back predict what the IL-6 levels are in, in mom throughout pregnancy from the newborn brain. Okay? We also will run a simple uh, random permutation test to make sure that this, this the, make sure that we're not, um, that the findings that we're seeing are not random. So essentially we'll get two distributions from this, from using, doing this partially squared regression of predicting or, ed, or estimating IL-6 from the connectivity networks. One will be the true distribution of our cross-validation. One will be just a random, a random null distribution, okay? And we're looking for a separation between two de these guys to know whether we can back predict IL-6 from connectivity in the newborn brain, okay? So here is just, I'm just going to quickly describe this before going on. So what we're looking at here is these are all of our networks in the brain that I described earlier. Um, what each box is is going to be well, how well that box actually, pre how well that box could estimate IL-6 levels from the newborn brain, okay? So if you go down the diagonal here, what we'd be looking at is all the within network connections, and in between is the between network connections, okay? So here's just one example. So if you look at from the subcortical systems and how it interacts with the dorsal tension system, you can see that, that we can indeed significantly, with from the system, we can indeed estimate IL-6 levels from the newborn brain connectivity. Um, we might, here's a within system, this is the salience network. The, the effect size is not nearly as strong, but there, it is, there is a significant association. And then what we can do is we then can look across all the, all the places what we're seeing here is the white boxes mean there was no, there was no um, ability greater than random chance to estimate the IL-6. And the other boxes that where you see distributions where you could, okay? Now what we've done to make this a little bit, to back, to make this a little bit simpler to be able to um, digest, so to speak, is you can, you can, you can take, this, you can take this, this matrix and turn it into just a spring embedding graph where where what we're looking at here is, is all the systems that have the diameter of the systems in here correspond to all the beta weights of the, of the connections in the model that connect with this system and how they relate to edit, um, estimating IL-6. Um, and if you see a circle, that means it's, it's within system. And if you see just a straight connection, it means between system. Now, this is still somewhat hard to look at, so we can back project this just onto the brain to know all the nodes in the brain that are important for estimating IL-6 
um, from the newborn brain. And that's what, this, that's what this image is. And what you can see is a lot of the systems that we talked about throughout, throughout um, or the earlier talk, the dorsal attention system, frontal parietal networks, the salience or single percular system that's important for sane attention and higher executive functioning. So what we're appearing to see, starting to see here, is a, a network of, of regions that are kind of widely distributed but are, appear to be important for estimating IL-6. Now, to look at the importance of this, one of the things that we did was we said, um, oh, I'm gonna skip past this. One of the things that we did was we said, okay, now that we know that there's this relationship between these regions here and, and put estimation of maternal information, we wanna know what, what, um, what cognitive functions these guys might be related to in the newborn later in life. Okay, so here now what we're doing is we're going to be looking at working memory. Okay, now we have these kids that come in at two years age and we can do working memory experiments on them where I think folks will know what working memory is, where it's an executive function that relates to temporarily holding information in mind for some action. It's different than long-term memory. We know it's resource limited and that you can have three or four items that you can hold in mind at a time. Um, but most importantly, it's, it's, um, it's reliable measurement at two years of age meaning we can collect it. Two is that it predicts emerging theory of mind, social skills, strong and consistent associations with academics at that age. It's very relevant to long-term outcomes, including ADHD that we talked about earlier. And it's atypical in lots of mental health disorders, including schizophrenia, autism, ADHD, and so on, okay? So the first, and this is our experiment, this is the behavioral experiment that the, these kids do when they're two. This is called spin the pots, where we you simply place a bunch of stickers under a, a bunch of cups here, okay? You leave um, two, of the, two of the pots empty, okay? And then you, you rotate the pot. And then the kids have, get higher scores the more efficiently that they're actually able to remember where the, where the blank stickers were and if they can find, find the information quickly, okay? Now, <clears throat> one of the first thing we did is we took this, we took working memory, so we have the behavior, and we, we did a, a, a simple meta-analysis using NeuroSynth online to describe, to ask, well, what parts of the brain are most important for working memory? This is a meta-analysis of 900, 907 studies. You can see the mask of all the, the parts of the brain that seem to be most light, tightly related to working memory across this meta-analysis. Now what we can do is overlay all the regions that were predictive of, of estimating IL-6, okay, in mom, and we can see that apparently there appears to be a large overlap with the regions that were, that were uh, predictive of IL-6 and its working memory performance, or, and, and its working memory mask, so to speak. And indeed, if you take the difference of the overlapping, if you take all the regions that overlap with this mask and compare it to the ones that don't, that that relationship is indeed quite significant. So now what we're seeing here is that we see that we have this brain regions that are relating to maternal information, and we, these brain regions, at least they relate to these they relate to the regions that seem to be most important for working memory. Of course, the next question is, well, can this inflammation then simply predict or account for some of the variance that you see in working memory in kids when they turn two years of age? Indeed, if you do that, what you can see, that the, if you can do the predictive model, indeed there is a tight relationship, seems to be negatively correlated, meaning the higher IL-6 levels that you have, the worse the working memory, working memory performance you have at two years of age, okay? Which kind of pulls this, pull this all together. And so where do we go from here? Well, one thing is that we know that the immune system doesn't work in a vacuum, okay? Interacts with all types of factors like genetics, other stressors, diet, et cetera. And so this is just gonna be a, a quick plug of the, the next stage of this work is where now we're adding several other maternal factors and I'll go over exactly what those are in a second or some of them are in a second to see if we can improve or increase the amount of variance we can account to these kids' working memory scores when the kids are two years of age. And indeed, if you use, if you, in combination with the IL-6 measure, if you use lots of other measures to try to, in the same type of, in some type of multivariate model, predict, you know, working memory scores, you can do a pretty good job. Well, what are, what are those factors that seem to be highest? What we're looking at here is a, is simply a, a graph of the beta weights um, of all the different connections. Um, and I'm just gonna point out a few of the highest ones. So things like total omega fatty omega threes during uh, in the diet, the overall maternal diet seems to be highly predictive of these scores. We just talked we earlier talked about BMI, physical activity. Um, again, 
not only IL-6, but also cortisol measurements. The actual cognitive performance of moms, so we think this is more tightly related genetic component. And even things like perceived SES, so not, so this would be socioeconomic status. So not necessarily the, the true SES, but actually the, the SES that's perceived where, the, where moms, moms feel they fall in society, okay? So what we've, what we've kind of learned here is that these maternal inflammation, in this case IL-6, relates to newborn brain connectivity. Um, it's important for executive functions like working memory at two years of age. It highlights the immune system as a potential target for intervention. And there's several other factors that are involved as well. So as we continue to embark on these massive efforts to, to map the human brain, both structurally and functionally, so ABCD, 10,000 participants, Lifespan HCP, another couple of thousand, ECHO project, another few thousand participants were, that are being, being scanned. We feel that improving our efficiency in which we collect data, like accounting for you know, movement, and understanding these pre and post environmental factors that influence these early trajectories are gonna be two important themes that need to be investigated much further before, before we can maximize the impact of those efforts. So I'm gonna end there. I'm gonna highlight that if, for folks interested in the ABCD study, the first, I believe, 1,500 or 2,000 scans are gonna be, are gonna be released this month or early, early next, month, next month if folks are interested in looking at that data. I'm also gonna just point out that the Flux Congress for, to study in, in cognitive development is gonna be important this year. So save the date, September 16th. The abstracts will be, are, are, will be due soon. Um, of course, a big thanks to all of our funding to conduct all this work, and I'll, I'll end there. Thank you.